بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين السلام عليكم السلام عليكم Oh, okay, that's better. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa nastaghfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayati a'malina ma yahdihi allahu fala mudillala wa ma yudlil fala hadiyala wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahduhu la sharika la wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu wa'ad. Um, bro, you take that off, man. I want to see, you know, like me there and me there as well. It's like a bit scary. Who's seen the video, by the way? Has anyone seen? Hands up. Who's se who hasn't seen it? Oh, that's quite a lot of people who haven't seen it, bro. And you, know, you stopped it now. It's still there. I put the eye era thing, man. It's like you know, with the spaceship. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, brothers and sisters, um, alhamdulillah. Who knows what Aira is about? What's Aira about, bro? Huh? It's about empowering people to give dawah. What is dawah? Who can tell me what dawah is? What is dawah? Huh? Invitation, right? Dawah is invitation. But invitation to what? To dinner? I know in Urdu, dawat. <laughs> yeah? I once said to this brother, enthusiastically, I said, brother, you know, you know, we have to give dawah. He said, no problem, you can come to my house for dinner. No problem. You give me dawat, I give you dawat. So invitation to what? To dinner? Huh? To Islam. Dawah, dawah is to invite people to Islam. In fact, more specifically, it's to invite people who are not yet Muslim to Islam. I era is about inviting non-Muslims to Islam. That's our focus. That's what we're concentrating on. Yes, lots of people come to us and they want us to give talks about Tarbiyah for the Muslims and reviving the Muslims and that's all very very important But we have many many organizations many groups looking after the Muslims the needs of the Muslims Giving Tarbiyah for the Muslims Educating the Muslims, but there is a very very distinct lack of organizations dedicated to calling people who are not yet Muslim to Islam Yet inviting people to Islam, calling those people who are not yet Muslim to Islam, is one of the most important duties and obligations of a Muslim. It is an intrinsic part of our deen. It's a, a, a fundamental part of our religion. It's the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent messengers he sent the messengers, That Allah tells us in the Quran that He did not send to any nation a messenger except that He invited the people, He called the people to single out Allah for worship and to leave the worship of the false gods. This was the task of all of the messengers. And you know, my brothers and sisters, you know, I challenge you to the next time you read the Quran, look out for what I'm, I'd be really interested in your feedback. Next time you read the Quran, when you're reading it, see how much or how many times when Allah tells us the stories of the prophets. Yeah. If we look at Nuh alayhi salam, if we look at Musa alayhi salam, if we look at Ibrahim alayhi salam, if we look at Isa alayhi salam, if we look at Yusuf, if we look at Yahya, if we look at the prophets, 
tell me how much you find in the Quran Allah describing their salah or their tahajjud or their dhikr or their zuhud or their siyam or their qiyam or their sadaqah or they're looking after the orphans and the poor and the needy see how much you can find because believe me there is very little if nothing not that these things I'm not suggesting these things are not important of course they are important but here's the reality when you read the Quran and you see what Allah tells us about the best of all the human beings, the best of creation, those individuals whose stories are supposed to inspire and motivate us, you will find those stories are almost exclusively about what? Dawah. Yes, Dawah. How they invited their people to Islam. Now there are some people who say, Dawa is through example. You see a piece of litter in the street, you pick it up. That's Dawa. You give your neighbor some food, that's Dawa. You see some poor people, you look after them, that's Dawa. Now that is very good, no doubt, mashallah, alhamdulillah. And of course, having good akhlaq is very very essential but dawa is not primarily my brothers and sisters through example no in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us man asanu qawla mimma allah who is better in qawl speech than the one who invites to allah inviting to allah is primarily through speech not through example, it is primarily through speech. Again, look to the stories of the prophets. You will find in the Quran, Allah is telling us, and the prophet said this, and Noah said that, and Saleh said that, and Musa said this, and Isa said that. Allah is primarily telling us about what they said, and of course, about the miracles and the signs they bought. Musa had the staff. Isa cured the sick and raised the dead through Allah's permission. And of course, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given. Just heard a long lecture about it. MashaAllah. The Quran. That's the miracle that Allah gave Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So yes, the prophets were given miracles, they were given proofs. But the problem with the idea that we give dawah through example, actually it's very problematic, brothers and sisters. On its own, it's problematic. Yes, Muslims should be the most honest, the most trustworthy, the most truthful, the best in their manners. Muslims should be good, upright citizens, no doubt about that. In fact, the Kuffar should be able to say about us, they are the most trustworthy people, they are the most reliable people, they are the most honest people. You know those Muslims? They're so honest, they get themselves into trouble with their honesty. That's how it should be, really. That's basic, brothers and sisters. Truthfulness. Truthfulness is very important. And all that surrounds truthfulness, with truthfulness comes trustworthiness, honesty, lack of deception, keeping our promises, fulfilling our trusts. These are the essential qualities. They are so important, the Prophet said, the believer could be a miser, the believer could be a coward, a believer could even drink alcohol or even steal, but a believer could never be a liar. The believer could never be a liar, never. And when you look at the prophets, 
And when you look at our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you see that there is a reason, there are characteristics, there are certain things that Allah chose those people for prophethood. He chose them, He selected them for certain reason, not because they were necessarily the richest amongst the people, not because they were necessarily the most noble in terms of lineage. Although they generally came from noble families, they were not necessarily the most noble in terms of lineage. They were not necessarily the most intellectual. In fact, there are some things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prevented His messengers from, from being poets, for example, even though in Arabia, as you've heard from Hamza, the poet was the most respected or amongst the most respected. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam away from being a poet. Even though in Egypt, the magicians were honored and respected and revered, of course, Allah kept away Musa from all types of magic. So there's some things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept his prophets away, but he chose them for what reason? For what qualities, brothers and sisters? You know what it was? What do you think those qualities are? What do you think? Huh? Trustworthiness? Yes. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what was he called before? By his al-ameen, the trustworthy one. He was nicknamed that by his people. What other qualities do you think? is so important. Huh? I can't hear. Honesty. Huh? Patience. Very, very important. Patience. What else? Huh? huh? Justice. Yes. Sincerity. Courage. All of these are very important qualities. But on top of them all, brothers and sisters, truthfulness. It has to be truthfulness you know of course in england we have a term for a, a dodgy person not a term but you know if i say used car salesman right used car salesman i apologize to any brothers who are in the used car salesman business right okay but I have a friend of mine, mashallah, who lives between like Germany and Dubai in America. And he was in Germany selling his car to a German, non-Muslim. And this brother meticulously went through every single scratch, every bump, every fault, every single thing in his car describing what was wrong with it. And the guy couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. He said, if only everybody was like you. He said, yes, but this is my religion. How can I sell you something if I don't describe it to you properly? properly? Allah will not bless the transaction otherwise. So I have to do that. That's what my religion teaches me. And this is the thing, brothers and sisters. Good character is dawa when they know that that good character comes from Islam. It's a part of your religion. Otherwise, the non-Muslim, when they look at you, they're not going to look at you and think, oh, look at this Muslim behaving well. That must be because Islam makes them behave like that. No, most of the time, that's not how people react, unfortunately. Most people, their mentality is, if they look at a Muslim, they think, terrorist. Al-Qaeda, right? They, they, this is what they, they, they look, I mean, not me. If they look at me, they think Jesus is here, right? But, but when they look at you guys, you know, black beards and, you know, the ninja outfit that my wife wears, the ninja outfit, right? So, but you know what I mean? I'm just saying, you know, the whole thing, they're scared. It's like, oh my God. So if they see you behaving well, they think, oh, they spent a bit of time in England and they got civilized. Yes, yeah, seriously. They think that you living in England has made you civilized. In other words, they think your good manners has come from you learning to be more English 
They don't look at you and think, whoa, their religion must be a great religion. No, they don't think that most of the time. Do you see? So this idea that giving dawah through good manners, no, actually displaying good manners actually just reinforces their own belief system about their own system. Right? Unless you're doing something extraordinary, for example, when they see us looking after the elderly, looking after our parents, refusing to put them in old age homes, they, now they can see a big difference between them and us, between how we behave and how they would behave. Okay, there's a, a clear difference. But in other things, like if you're queuing, you see, patiently queuing, huh? they think, oh, they've learned to be English now. Because when they went to Pakistan and Egypt, and did they see anyone queuing? No way. Right? So that's why Dawa has to be through speech. Unless you say to them, okay, this is because my religion teaches me that. This is because my religion teaches me this. So good manners are important. They support the message. They're essential and Muslims should be like that anyway. But the top of these things, brothers and sisters, is truthfulness. Truthfulness is very, very important. Truthfulness is very important. When the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was first ordered to give da'wah openly, to openly invite the non-Muslims to Islam, he went on the top of Mount Safa. You of course all know what Mount Safa is, right? Safa and Marwa. In Mecca, the two hills, Safa and Marwa. It was a custom amongst the pagan Arabs that if Mecca was being attacked, a person would have to strip themselves naked and go to the top of the mount and call people to warn them. Right? Now, why do you think they had to strip naked first? Why do you think they had that tradition? You heard the story of Cry Wolf? You know the Aesop's fable? You don't. <laughs> you said, who knows the Aesop's fable of the boy who cried wolf? Hands up. Right, that's everybody, right? More or less. So you know the story, the boy he cried wolf, 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 and he just did it to joke. Yeah? Second time, he cried wolf, 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 and the people came running, and he was laughing. The third time, the wolf actually came, but no one believed him. Yeah? So, why to strip naked? To avoid people just making a full school. So the Prophet wasallam, he's standing on top of Mount Safa, but he's clothed, fully clothed, and he's calling the people. He calls each tribe of Mecca by name. He calls them by name. Yeah, Benny this, yeah, Benny, he calls them by name. And they all, the, either the leader of the tribe comes or they send a representative. And then the Prophet Muhammad says, Oh my people, if I was to tell you that there was an army about to attack us from behind this hill, would you believe me? Would you believe me? They said, Muhammad, we never heard anything except truth from you. Of course we would believe you. Subhanallah. Think about that. Can you think about that? It's not just them going, yeah, yeah, go on, tell us. No, they say, Muhammad, we never heard anything except truth from you. Can you imagine your people saying that? Can you imagine his whole people, the leaders of all of these tribes? We never heard anything except truth from you, Muhammad. Of course we'd believe you. Subhanallah. Actually, from that moment, from the first moment that Prophet Muhammad calls them public to Islam, Allah has already established the proof against them from that moment. From the moment they testify with their mouth, we never heard you lie. We never heard anything except truth from you. And then he says to them, 
I have come to warn you of a terrible punishment from your Lord. In another narration, it mentions, I warn you of the fire, I warn you of the fire, I warn you of the fire. This is the one who always spoke the truth. You see, when we look at the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, just as the Quran is a miracle that proves the truthfulness of its message, the Prophet Muhammad himself, his life, his behavior, his personality is also a proof that Islam is the truth. Because what explanation can a person give for the phenomena that was this man Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What explanation do they want to give for what he said, for what he taught, for what he did? Do they want to say he is a liar? Do they want to say that Muhammad was a liar? That he invented Islam? That he made it up? But that would make him a liar, right? If he invented it and he made it up and he constructed it, that would make him a liar. But his people confessed, we never heard anything except truth from you. When the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, sent a letter to the Emperor of Rome, Heraclius, inviting him to Islam, when Heraclius received the letter, it happened that the arch enemy of the Prophet Muhammad, Abu Sufyan, who was the leader of the Quraysh at the time, he was in the court of the Roman Emperor. And they were doing business with the Romans at the time. And when the Emperor received this letter, he asked, is there any amongst you people from this land? And Abu Sufyan and his companions said, yes, we are. So he told Abu Sufyan to stand in the front. And then he said to his companions, if he says anything that's not true, contradict him. And Abu Sufyan said, if it was not for my fear of my companions exposing me, I would have lied. And then Heraclius asked Abu Sufyan a series of questions. He asked about his lineage. He said, yes, he's from the nobility amongst us. He said, yes, the prophets were from the noble people of their family. He asked, did any of his descendants used to be kings and then they were usurped, so they were thrown out of their kingship? He said, no. Who follows him, the poor or the rich? The poor. Do you find him lying about people? Abu Sufyan said, we never heard him lie about people. Does he break his treaties? He said, no, but we're in a treaty with him and we, we don't know which way it's going to go. And Abu Sufyan said, this is the only opportunity I had to put something against, the, uh, against Prophet Muhammad. This is just this one statement. We don't know which way it's going to go. So these are the questions he asked. So then Heraclius said, I asked you whether he's from the nobility of the people. You said yes. So the prophets were. I asked you, were any of his descendants kings? You said no. I was thinking, if some of his descendants were kings, he may be using this to try and get power again. You, I asked you, were the poor following him or the rich? You said the poor. So this is who most of the prophets are followed by the poor people in their community. And I asked you whether he lied. And this is the point I want to get to. And you said no. So Heraclius said, so I wondered if he never lied about men, how could he lie about Allah? How could he lie about God? And I asked you, was he treacherous to his treaties? You said no. So the prophets are always, they are never treacherous.
And he asked another question. The other question he asked him was, who is winning in your battles between each other? And Abu Sufyan said, sometimes we win, sometimes they, we win, sometimes he wins. And, and the Heraclius said, and that's how it is with the prophets. Sometimes winning, sometimes not winning, until Allah brings the conclusion in their favor in the end. And this, by the way, this whole incident impressed Abu Sufyan hugely. But the important thing I want to mention here, brothers and sisters, the qualities that Heraclius recognized, the qualities of prophethood, but the honesty that he never lied about people. How would he lie about Allah? These qualities of honesty and truthfulness are so important. You can't have someone who is a used car salesman representing the message from Allah. You know the used car salesman? He makes you think that the clapped out Ford Escort with 20,000, you know, 200,000 miles on the clock is in fact a closet Porsche. Yeah? Underneath it really is a Porsche just waiting to unleash it. And all you have to just sit in the seat and it will go. It's a real runner. <laughs> it's a real runner. Yeah. You ever bought one of those real runners? <laughs> no, you can't have someone like that representing the message you know when this man says something everyone listens we know he's truthful we know he's honest he never lies straight away and so that's important brothers and sisters the muslims this is part of our problem as a community how many people do you think look at the muslims and think oh they're the honest ones they're the trustworthy ones they're the truthful ones subhanallah that's not the reputation we've got in the world, is it really, generally? So truthfulness is very important. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah blessed him with truthfulness. So what explanation can we give a man who never lied? He starts just to lie now about Allah. Okay, why would a person lie about God? Why would a person claim to be a prophet? Why would a person make up such a story? Like Heraclius, maybe he wants to get power, right? So maybe a person wants power. Yes? What else? What other things do you think a person might want if they claimed falsely to be a prophet? Power? What else? Huh? Money? What else? Huh? Status, power, money. What else? Women? Yeah? Maybe they want women? Like David Quraysh, remember that guy from Waco, Texas? Yeah. Or Elijah Muhammad, al Kadhab. You know why Malcolm X left the nation of Islam? You know what, brothers and sisters? When the Prophet Muhammad started preaching his message, the leaders of the Quraysh came to him and they said to him, Muhammad, what do you want? Do you want to be our king? Do you want to be our king? We will make you our king. Do you want money? We will make you the richest man amongst us. And if it is women that you desire, name them, they are yours. Or if you are sick and you have some illness and this spirit that you came, that you claim comes to you and inspires you, we will spend any amount of money to get you a cure. And the Prophet Muhammad, what is his reply? His famous reply. He said, if you give me the sun in one hand, and you give me the moon in another, I will never leave off preaching this message. In another narration it mentions, I am no more able to give up what I am calling, calling you to any more than you can take a torch and light it from the sun. Does, is this the words of a deceiver? A man who is watching his followers being tortured, being killed, himself is suffering so much hardship they are making such an offer to him it's inconceivable to accuse such a person of being a liar 
a con man. And where did he get this information from? The Quran is so full of this information. The stories of the prophets, history, science, philosophy. An illiterate man who couldn't read and couldn't write. Where did he get this knowledge from? The descriptions of the afterlife, the day of judgment, the paradise, the hellfire. Where did he get such information from, my brothers and sisters? Do you know some Christians, some ancient Christian polemicists, so a polemicist is someone who writes against something. So Christians who used to write against Islam, some of them actually thought that Muhammad himself was a Christian bishop who had fled to Arabia. They actually claim that Muhammad himself was a Christian bishop. Because that's the only way they could explain the information that they found in the Quran. Some of them claim that he learned from a Nestorian monk and that he learned all this information. But the fact is that all of those accusations would be making Muhammad a liar. But he was so far from being a liar, brothers and sisters. Maybe as they claim, what else, what other options do we have? Was he mad? Was he deluded? Was he sincere? He really thought he was a prophet. He really believed it, but he was deluded. Does the Quran read like a book from a deluded person? Does Muhammad behave sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Look at his character. Look at the profile of a deluded person. Look in the seerah of the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Is that what we find? You see, his life is a proof. And Allah says, Never will the people of the book, from the people of the book, and the, the polytheists, they will never leave off disbelieving until there comes to them al bayyina And what is al bayyina Rasulun min Allah, a messenger from Allah, yatlu suhufan mutahara, reciting to them purified pages. Fiha qutubun qayyima, with upright laws. So here we find Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A proof, a bayyina, a messenger from Allah, being guided from the creator of the heavens and the earth. This is the only sex sensible explanation we can have for this phenomena that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I want to mention, mention to you one final incident from the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For me, for me, this is really the most amazing incident because it is it really leaves a person with very little place to go except to say oh well maybe it didn't happen but look imagine this after 20 years or 21 two years of preaching islam the prophet muhammad has a son the son is born to his wife, or some say it was a slave girl, some say it was a wife, Maryam. She used to be, or she was a copt, and she gave birth to a son, and his name was Ibrahim. When Ibrahim was six months old, six months old, Ibrahim died in the arms of the Prophet. The Prophet was carrying Ibrahim, he died in his arms. You can imagine. So he is. The Prophet Muhammad, his son dies in his arm. On the same day that his son dies, there is an eclipse of the sun. On the same day his son dies, there is an eclipse of the sun. Now even today, brothers and sisters, even today, if I said to some people, and there's the proof, that's it. His son died on the same day his son died, there's an eclipse of the sun. Doesn't that prove to you as a prophet? A lot of people go, yeah, that sounds like, that's amazing. And sure enough, 
When this happened, many of the people came out of their homes. They came out of their homes saying, look, even the sun darkens for the death of the child of the messenger of God. Now imagine you'd spent 21 years trying to convince everybody that you're a prophet. Imagine 21 years conning them, fooling them, trying to convince them. What would a con man do? What would a liar do? What would a deceiver do? He wouldn't miss an opportunity. He'd say, yes, you see, I told you I was a prophet. What more proof do you want? Right? Isn't that what a con man would do? Isn't that what a second, second, second hand car salesman would do? Huh? See, I told you it was a push. You see, I told you. And if he was deluded, if he was mad, he'd say the same thing. This is an age of superstition. This is normal superstitious belief for people. But the Prophet Muhammad says something remarkable. He actually calls the people. He calls them. This is his habit. When there was something important, he would call the people to the mosque, to the masjid. And he called the people and he said to them, Oh my people, this is the sun and this is the moon. And they are from the ayats, the proofs of Allah. And they don't eclipse for the birth or the death of any man. So when you see this, you should pray to Allah. Now this, these are the words of a truthful man. These are the words that the only explanation, the only sex sensible explanation that you can come for these words is that this man was what he claimed to be. He was truthful. He wasn't deluded. He was what he claimed to be, a messenger from God. And look how he directs people to connect with Allah. Not to think about him, but to connect with their creator. And you find this again and again and again in the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is all about getting people to connect with Allah, to worship Allah. Even he warns people, don't exaggerate in praising me. Don't exaggerate in praising me. Don't do to me what the Christians did to Jesus. I am just a slave of Allah and his messenger. Don't exaggerate in praising me. When I tell you something from the religion, do it. If I give you my opinion, I'm just like you. I give you my opinion. I could be right, I could be wrong. He's telling us he's a man. But when he says something, this is from God, that's what you have to follow. Anyone who studies with an open heart and an open mind, the life of Prophet Muhammad, especially a Jew or a Christian, any Jew or Christian who is versed in their scripture, if they read the life of Prophet Muhammad, a proper life of Prophet Muhammad, I mean, you know, something written by a Muslim, not something, some lies written like you find some of the things, unfortunately, the Christians have written. You, you read that, they will know that he is a messenger. Just like they know their son is their son, they will recognize that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a prophet. Absolutely. No doubt about it, my brothers and sisters. So our duty is to call people to Allah. Our duty is to invite people to Allah. What we do in our era is empower you to give the da'wah. We're here to teach you and to help you to learn how to fulfill that obligation. You have to do it, brothers and sisters. It's not my job to talk to your neighbors. It's not my job to talk to your work colleagues. It's not my job to talk to the people you meet on the street. It's your job. 
Allah's going to ask you. Do you want to meet Allah on the day of judgment? That you stand in front of Allah and you see your good deeds and inshallah I hope they're mountains of good deeds and you see them but standing between you and your good deeds imagine is George is Michelle is Jane is Jack oh Allah they were my neighbor I worked with them for 20 years we spent hours together they never told me about Islam. They never told me about Islam. Imagine that. Imagine that situation. What are you going to say? What's your answer to Allah going to be? You were too scared? Did I hear that? I was too frightened? Of what? What were you frightened of? When the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if and he went knocking on the doors of every single person, according to some narrations, he spent 10 days in Ta'if knocking on every single door to call the people to Islam. And when they left, they stoned him. So the blood ran down his, all down his body and stuck the sandals to his feet. Is that going to happen to you, brothers and sisters? You know what? If someone does that to you, you just need to get out your mobile phone and call the police. And they will defend you. The police will defend you. That's how easy it is for you to give dawah. And you're afraid? Subhanallah. Subhanallah, brothers. Subhanallah, sisters. What's your answer going to be to Allah? I didn't know. What do you have to know? Do you have to be a scholar? Do you think you have to be a scholar to give dawah? No, you don't. The Prophet ﷺ said, convey my message, even if it is one ayah. If you know one ayah, convey it. That's all you need to know. Don't you know one ayah? Don't you know one ayah? Don't you know Surah Fatiha? Don't you know Surah Al-Ikhlas? Don't you know what it means? La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And here we are. If you don't know, we'll teach you. That's what we do. Come to our one day dawah training course. Be amazed what you will learn in one day. In fact, most of what you will learn is, is what you're learning here today already. If you didn't already know it. I mean, hands up. Who knew the Prophet was the truthful one? Hands up. Yeah? Who, keep your hands up if you knew most of the stories that I mentioned today about the Prophet ﷺ. Who knew the story about the eclipse? You knew that, right? Who knew the Prophet was offered to be a king or to have the money or to have the women? You knew that, right? You knew it. Who knew the Quran is a miracle? Hands up. Who knew at least that there are amazing scientific statements in the Quran? Hands up. Okay. Who knows Allah is one? Yeah? Okay. That's it. You know how to give dawah. Because you know what we teach? Go rap. No, we don't teach you. It's not a rapping lesson. Yeah. We teach you, you know what? When you engage with non-Muslims, don't talk about apostasy in Islam and homosexuality and the hijab and pork and 18 different reasons why pork is haram because it's got trichinosis and it's got this disease and that disease and whatever. So some smart person comes to you and says, okay, if I can find you a piece of pork and I can prove to you it's got no disease in it, will you eat it? What are you going to say? What are you going to say then? Are you going to eat it, brothers? If I can give you a piece of pork and I guarantee there's no disease in it, will you eat it? Okay, so why is it haram? Because Allah said it's haram. That's it. So let's get back to basics. Do you believe in Allah or not? That's what you need to ask them. Ask the non muslim do you believe in God? If you believe in God, is God one or many? Oh, so you believe in one God. Okay. So how do we know whether a religion is from God or not? 
Well, look what I have to offer. Let me explain to you why I think the Quran is from God. Let me explain to you why I think Muhammad is the prophet of God. That's it. God's existence, God's oneness, revelation and prophethood. Get back to basics, brothers and sisters. That's how to give dawah. That's what we teach. Does that sound difficult? Does that sound easy? Yeah, sounds easy, right? Very easy. It's not difficult. I know now you, you probably don't want to say anything because your excuses are now diminishing to nothing. Yeah? So brothers and sisters, please, this is way too important to ignore. You know, the final thing I want to finish before I go on way, way, way over my time, I want to finish with a thought or a question that you need to answer. Do you think that on the day of judgment, Allah is going to ask our brothers and sisters living in the mountains in Pakistan or our brothers and sisters living in the deserts of Somali or our brothers and sisters in Indonesia working in the rice fields. Do you think Allah is going to ask them about why they didn't give dawah to the non-Muslims in England? Do you think Allah is going to ask them yes or no? No. So who do you think Allah is going to ask about that? Us, yeah. Us living amongst them, living next to them. And Allah made our life so easy, brothers. So easy, sisters. We get in the car, we drive, we turn on the tap and out comes hot water. We don't have to walk 20 miles. We open the tap and hot water comes out. We can buy our shopping in a supermarket and store it for a week. Our life is so easy. What excuse have we got? What excuse have we got? No, we are more responsible and we are more accountable. So brothers and sisters, let's remember Walla Asr. By time, the time that is running out, Asr is from, it comes from the Arabic word Asir. You know what Asir? Asir is juice. Asir lamun min fadlak. Give me some orange juice, please. Asir means because it's squeezed out. The time is running out. Asr. It's the time that's running out. All of the human beings are in a state of loss. Except those who believe and do righteous actions. But Allah didn't leave it there, brothers and sisters. He kept going. He added two more things. If you don't want to be in a state of loss, you must believe, you must do righteous actions, and you must tawasso bil haq, and you must tawasso bil sabr, which means you have to support each other and be people who are calling to truth. And you have to be patient. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.